Hello again and welcome to uh, the third video. This is where we will jump into the lower respiratory system. And these infections, if we had to average them, um, are generally more damaging than upper respiratory tract infections just because um, damage to the pharynx or damage to the nasal cavity um, is not quite on the same plane as damage to the lungs. Um, but we don't average them, we look at them one at a time. So here we go, pertussis. This is uh, the whooping cough. This is a disease um, that we prevent with a vaccine, but it still does occur. It's um, contagious. I don't have the numbers for how contagious, but it will spread in dormitories, things like that. And the main thing it does is cause people to have a very bad cough. And um, so, People start off with a fever and a general malaise, um, but then they get to this uh, paroxysmal stage where they have paroxysms, and we'll get to that um, in the next couple of slides. And then it can take three months to stop coughing. So people who get this would know it because it would be disruptive. Um, there's during this stage, you're not going to be able to sit through class or go to work. Um, and during this stage, you're not going to be able to sleep. A lot of people with pertussis have trouble sleeping uh, because they cough so much, so they sleep sitting up, etc., um, and things like that to get around it. Um, a paroxysm, in this case, is a coughing fit um, that completely compresses the lungs till um, the person uh, has to whoop to inhale. Um, and all of this is involuntary. It's cough, 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 and then a forced, powerful inhalation, um, which makes a noise because the um, airways are not open. The person isn't, isn't expecting to do this inhalation. And so... Um, this is a violent process and um, can can be very disruptive. Um, in young children, this can be dangerous um, to the point of being deadly. In older people, it is generally not. Um, so we're mostly concerned about very young children, like under one years old. Um, in uh, older people, like uh, teenagers, um, a third of them will lose weight when they get this disease. Almost a third of them will have at least one episode where they lose control of their bladder during a paroxysm. Some will pass out, some will break ribs. I mean, this is not a normal cough. This is not something that you would experience from um, influenza or, or typical pneumonia. This is um, much more intense. So we try to prevent it and we have to do this again because it does pose a big risk to young children. Um, and so several of the major vaccines we take, um, DPT back, back when I was younger and now Tdap and DTAP, these all protect against pertussis. The P always stands for um, pertussis. And um, this is com commonly given to pregnant women so that they can pass antibodies on to um, the, the newborn. And the dangerous stage is, again, after the newborn loses maternal antibodies and before they can start really mounting their own powerful adaptive immune responses. Um, so um, what what we're concerned about is that um, there there isn't much protection for children who are too young to be vaccinated. And so um, older siblings going to school can bring it home, and that's why they push for entire families to be vaccinated against, um, against bord Bordetella pertussis. Um, so, right. Well, how common is it? Well, um, it's not always reported. Not all cases are as severe as what I was describing. Um, but in one snapshot of a year, uh, 2013, there were 100,000 cases um, known and 
roughly 100,000 deaths. And in the U.S., um, what we see is a big drop in incidents when the, um, the first vaccines came out, and now we're seeing an occasional rise. So in 2012, there was a big um, bump in the number of pertussis cases in the U.S. There were 50,000. Um, and so this kind of takes, well, this is kind of a strange thing because we just, we know there are more cases than are reported um, outside of the U.S., but also, um, most years we don't have as many cases as we did in 2012. But you can, well, let's look at this graph. So this is incidents in the U.S., um, both long-term from the 20s to 2018, and then uh, from the 90s to 2018, so you get a little more resolution in these years. As we were back here, Imagine your point of view in 2007 or 2008, seeing that big bump in 2005, 6, and then seeing it increase. And in 2012, when there are 50,000 cases in the U.S., all we knew was that there was vaccine denying and vaccine hesitancy and um, people were not vaccinated. So we saw this rising, and we did not know, was this going to keep going back up? We didn't know what level it would go to. And so we've been pleasantly surprised um, that um, it hasn't stayed that high, but still we're seeing something like 15,000 cases per year. And this gets reported um, usually when a young child gets it and has to be hospitalized. So these do represent... Um, serious illnesses. Okay, that's enough about pertussis. Tuberculosis is a different story. Tuberculosis is not at all rare. Um, it's somewhat rare in the U.S., um, but around the world it is the most deadly infectious disease. I'm not talking about its case fatality rate, nothing like that. It's just it kills the most people, and that's partly because um, almost one out of every four people in the world is infected. And I've seen, um, a few years ago, they were saying one out of every three, so I'm, I'm really not sure what the number is, but it doesn't matter. It's a huge number of people. More than a billion people currently have a latent tuberculosis infection. And um, that can be lifelong latency, but there's a 10% chance that any one of those people um, will eventually... Um, get a recurrence, um, and what we call secondary tuberculosis disease, secondary active tuberculosis disease. That's when the latency ends and the bacteria start attacking the body again. Um, and, and so in one year, we can lose a million people throughout the world to tuberculosis, um, and we can see tens of millions of people infected. Tuberculosis is also a disease we thought um, could be kind of eradicated because we can treat it with antibiotics, but it turns out to be a much harder um, thing to do. In the U.S., we don't have as much tuberculosis, um, partly because we don't have as many situations where people are as likely to, um, to spread this disease through, through droplets. Um, Right, so tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. And if that name rings a bell, mycobacterium, it should, because mycobacterium is the genus, um, well, the bacterium that causes Hansen's disease or leprosy is from the same genus, and they have important things in common. One important thing in common is that they grow slowly. Um, slow growing, right. Another is that they're acid fast. So you won't ever see a gram stain picture of these because the crystal violet cannot penetrate um, their cell walls. So we have to do a more aggressive stain just to see them under the microscope. And so um, acid fast bacteria would appear red and everything else gets stained blue to make it visible. So they are these little ugly squiggles. Um, they, right, uh, let's see, 
this is not something that's spread by animals. It's just spread from person to person. And it's spread in places like prisons, um, nursing homes, places where people have to, in other cases, have to huddle together, refugee camps, uh, homeless people. Um, and also people have, in most cases, a healthy person might not get it. Um, so we see uh, people with weaker immune systems being um, infected at higher, higher rates. It is certainly possible for a healthy person to get infected by tuberculosis, um, but we don't see it as much, and there are reasons for that. So what I'll say is that for tuberculosis, um, there are a complex series of outcomes of this disease, and so we kind of walk through it step by step so that you can understand what's going on. Initially, when the person gets um, exposed, they get a primary infection. So if they inhale enough, um, their alveolar macrophages will, um, will eat the bacteria. So that is, if the bacteria make it all the way into the alveoli of the lungs, the macrophages will eat them. But for whatever reason, um, usually these bacteria are able to survive in macrophages. And when that happens, when enough macrophages um, recognize something's going wrong and um, they can't kill the bacteria in their cytoplasm, they start to send out signals that recruit other macrophages to form a granuloma. This is exactly what we see in Hansen's disease, where if you remember those slides with the picture of the person with all of the lesions on his face, those are granulomas and they form exactly the same way. The difference is in tuberculosis it happens in the lungs, in Hansen's disease it's more likely to happen in skin. Um, so, um, so we get this walled off tubercle or granuloma in the lung um, and over time, um, if, if it successfully traps the bacteria, it will eventually calcify and um, you'll be able to see it on an x-ray. Um, we call that asymptomatic primary infection. So that is if, so when the person first gets it, if the first thing that happens in the lungs is um, macrophages successfully trap it, kill it in that gran granuloma, then that's an asymptomatic primary infection. So let's think about this. Um, this would be when a person is first exposed to the tuberculosis bacteria, and what would happen in an alveolus, so here we're looking at the interior with an airway and um, a tiny capillary, a macrophage would find the cell and it would eat it, but it wouldn't be able to kill it. And so typically what's going to happen is it's going to send out signals that attract other macrophages to it, and they will form a granuloma around it. And so that original macrophage in the center runs out of oxygen and dies. Um, and the question is, do the, do the tuberculosis bacteria, does the mycobacterium tuberculosis cells, do they escape or not? And if they escape, well, that goes on to becoming a disease. But when this is happening, the patient doesn't know about it because this is really just the first exposure. And so um, if it's successfully trapped in here, then there will be no disease. Then this is over um, for the most part. Yeah, this, this would be over, and this would eventually calcify, and the patient would never know unless they took certain um, clinical tests. They would they'd have no sign that they ever had tuberculosis. This is a concept map that shows us the possible outcomes of tuberculosis. And this is um, more complicated than it needs to be. I'm going to put the curiosity symbol on this so you don't have to study it if you don't want to, but it's important that it's here in case you're curious. We started here with exposure to um, the cells. If that um, granuloma works, then there's no infection. The cells don't spread. But in 30% of cases, that initial granuloma does not hold the cells and they escape. So if this happens, people will eventually um, 
give a positive tuberculosis test. And so notice in this concept map we have like what's happening to the patients and what they're showing on the various tests they take. So at this point, um, they have this infection, and um, this can lead to a few things. It can lead to latency um, if the immune system quickly tackles those escaping bacteria, or it can lead to active disease um, if they can't. So um, this, that's what this is showing. If the bacteria escape the initial attempt to trap them, um, they get um, the chance, these bacteria get a chance to cause um, bad pneumonia. And so um, in some fraction of cases where people are um, either, well, basically where people are immunocompromised um, in some way, they'll get the primary active tuberculosis disease, and this is a uh, very bad form of pneumonia. Most cases, however, um, even if the bacteria escape that initial tubercle, um, the immune system will keep it under control and it won't be able to cause disease. And this is the latent tuberculosis infection that happens to um, roughly a quarter of the Earth's population. Um, so if we go back to here, well, primary active tuberculosis disease is tuberculosis, and so that is leading to either um, death within two years for um, untreated people, they have a 50% chance of dying within two years, or if they get treatment, most of them will survive. Um, with the latent infection, they have a 10% chance of of um, getting this secondary active disease um, and so this can lead to the same outcomes as the primary active disease would um, but for the majority of these people they will stay in this latency and never have the disease um, right so um, in the secondary active disease this is what we think of in, in a lot of cases as what many people have had through history. So after an asymptomatic latency, they'll have this reactivation and for whatever reason the cells will escape the tubercles. And um, this might happen because someone got older or it might happen because for some reason their immune system got damaged. But either way, um, a mycobacterium gets into the blood and lymph and um, wherever it ends up, it starts attacking the tissues. So this is the list of things that can happen. Infection and damage to, well, let's just improve this, um, to the lungs. So this is what we'd expect from a bad pneumonia like tuberculosis. Um, damage to lymph nodes, and that's going to obviously um, hurt a person's immune system. Damage to... Um, the serous uh, membranes around um, the heart and lungs. You can imagine how bad that can be. Damage the kidneys and the bones, the actual vertebrae, the discs and the, the bodies um, can be damaged uh, severely by this. Uh, joints can be damaged and then um, in one of the most severe outcomes, the central nervous system can experience um, deadly meningitis and then um, sepsis can also happen. So the secondary active disease has a lot of different ways it can present and a lot of different ways it can hurt a person. Um, so either it comes from the primary infection or from reactivation of a latent infection, but one way or another um, the tubercle liquefies and lets the, the bacteria out and they spread um, through blood and wherever they end up, um, they um, wherever they end up, um, there's a 50% chance they're going to kill a person. And so one form of this miliary um, tuberculosis is 
where it spreads in the blood and lymph and people we see attacks all over the body where lesions form all over the body and the other forms um, you can you can read about them there are a lot of different things that can happen um, treatment of tuberculosis is possible but tricky because the bacteria grow slowly um, you can't cure them with one shot of a cephalosporin like you could with a lot of other bacteria um, so um, people need to take daily antibiotics for at least two months and in some cases years and this is these are cocktails of antibiotics so they might be taking three different oral antibiotics every day for two months and so um, there's a high chance that people who are um, especially marginalized so homeless people or drug users who are already experiencing the weakened immune system there's a chance that they won't be able to comply with the treatment regimen and so for tuberculosis especially direct observed therapy is what um, is recommended and yeah and it's a complex thing tuberculosis treatment is tricky because the cells grow so slow so if um, if there's a failure of compliance or whatever um, there can be transfer of antibiotic resistance genes and um, a person can wind up with multi-drug resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis and in this case um, it no longer responds to the primary um, antibiotics we use to treat it it's always a risk factor when um, the initial antibiotics fail the bacteria can cause more damage while we are waiting to figure out what antibiotic to use and so this can be uh, dangerous and so in in some outbreaks in the u.s we've seen it and it has killed um, a lot of the people who've been infected just because the initial treatment doesn't work more common than that is if it's untreated the secondary tuberculosis um, it's a wasting disease so it has a slow progression and it's going to start with something like weight loss and the the conclusion that the clinical microbiology book gives is if you're a clinician and a person comes in with a, some kind of a wasting disease your first guess is going to be some kind of a cancer um, because some organs are being attacked um, slowly and this will mimic that so um, always have in the back of your mind that a person with a wasting disease could have um, tuberculosis they could have a secondary active tuberculosis and treating that before it gets worse um, can save their life so there's that okay so um, what we're gonna look at next will be technical pneumonias these are diseases that go after the lungs and have the classical symptoms of and signs of pneumonia whereas tuberculosis is a very specific thing um, these pneumonias are more um, common to each other so we'll see that in the next video